People have no idea what's coming. Ich darf mich gerne überraschen. Du kannst das Beste nicht sagen. Und hier steckt ein! Wow, I love it! So kann es gerne weitergehen. This is gonna be good. The NHL season is almost upon us. And for that reason, it is a gimme. It is a given. It is a certainty that one person has to return on a uh, hockey o'clock. And it is none other than Austria's favorite National Hockey League pundit, as I, I called it in the invitation. It's no other than former NHL head coach and GM Tom Rowe and coach so Thankful that you're returning for another season of talking about the National Hockey League for Austrian fans. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. Love it. And uh, it's always good talking with you. And uh, it's always good to be able to stay in touch with people in Austria. Coach, it's been quite some time since you last graced the podcast with your appearance. What's life been in, in South Carolina for you? Well, life's been good. Uh, obviously, in South Carolina, we have a lot of golf courses. Uh, weather's unbelievable. I, I live right down the street from a beach. Uh, my grandkids are here, so my wife and I uh, keep busy with beach and taking care of our grandkids, and, and I'm at the golf course quite a bit. That's at least until a, another coaching job comes along. <laughs> Very glad to hear that you're enjoying life, but as regards other coaching opportunities, how involved have you been in the business? How how many offers, how many serious offers have there been? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had offers. I've had, you know, three offers uh, that were serious, um, two offers, and then another one that was fairly serious, but just, I didn't think it was a good fit. And, um, you know, I'm not looking to hit it out of the ballpark when it comes to salary. But just to be totally honest, I just think fair market value is, is where it should be. And, and I just, I just want to make sure that I can go someplace um, like I did in lens, you know, you and I have talked about lens at length. It was just such a great fit there with Christian Prethala and the players the players absolutely made it unbelievable for me as a coach. Uh, so I'm looking for something similar to that. And um, if the right opportunity comes along, then I'll jump at it. And I guess I'm at the point in my life, if it isn't the right opportunity, and, and I don't think uh, I can build something with the general manager for whatever particular team, then you know what, I'll just, I'll continue to be patient and wait. Now we were talking about it the, the other day, it seems. Uh, it's been a couple of months, but uh, your day revolves around obviously family golf and a lot of hockey how many hockey leagues and 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 basically all the european leagues have started now are you currently following where where a job offers or potential job opportunities coming from yeah i mean i the leagues that i follow literally daily and, and watch video on a uh, couple of games in each league maybe i don't watch them from beginning to end but i definitely watch video um on the system I use are, are obviously the ice age in Austria. I have, that is, and again, I, I just had such an unbelievably positive experience in that league. You know, I, I watch it, watch that very close, watch the DEL uh, closely because I know a lot of the players and coaches in that league. And then obviously the NLA in Switzerland and the NLB in Switzerland, uh, the, the primary four leagues that I'm watching closely and, and staying on top of in case anything um, comes about in any of those leagues. But, you know, I, I got a, it's funny. I've got a, a fondness for Austria. I love the country, love the people I met there. And, um, you know, if the right opportunity came in there, I wouldn't hesitate to go back. Now, if one had to look for the lowest common denominator of, of those four leagues you mentioned, it would probably be the, the language German um, that's that's spoken in, in in most of them or large parts of them. How's your German coming along? <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> I, I figure at 65 years old, I'll just stick with the English. And, uh, you know, it's funny, on the golf course the other day with a couple of buddies of mine, we got talking about that. And we, we were saying how people in the United States and North America in general, you know, really only use one language where the Europeans have, you know, skills to use three or four languages, which has always impressed everybody in our country. And, uh, but I, I don't know, call it laziness, arrogance, ignorance, whatever you want to call it over here. Uh, 
with English being a common language around the world, you know, it makes, I think it makes us pretty lazy and we don't really get too aggressive on learning another language. First of all, I wouldn't call it neither nor, neither laziness nor, <laughs> nor anything else. And if you ever return to German speaking realms, I'll be happy to help getting you <laughs> up to speed as regards your, your German speaking. But the, The great thing, and that's the main reason why I, I was able to, to bring you back on, is hockey season is almost upon us as regards the National Hockey League. How excited are you for the upcoming campaign? Well, I, you know, I, love, I love hockey in general, but watching um, how the National Hockey League is getting so much younger and so much more skilled and faster, and um, that's what I love to see. I, I like to see what new systems are put in place, I like to follow coaches, different coaching styles, obviously, you know, guy, there are, there's a good percentage of coaches now starting to, you know, be structured, but not overly structured. And Joel Quenville comes to mind. He did a great job in Florida, Gerard Gallant. Well, I, I think Jeremy Colleton in Chicago. I mean, they have systems, but they're not strangling the players with systems where they can't make plays. And at the end of the day, Um, you got to let the players be creative. That's what the fans want to see. So that's what I'm excited to watch when the season first starts and, and see how many young guys make the NHL rosters and, and see what they can actually do once they get into meaningful games. Exhibition games, I don't put a lot of stock in because you're, playing, you're not playing against NHL rosters for the mo ma ma most part. Uh, but once the real stuff um, – starts to happen and the real bullets start flying around, then, it, then it's fun to watch and see what young kids can do and, and how faster the leagues get. Because every year it seems to be getting faster and more skilled. Now, it seems just like it happened a couple of days ago when the Tampa Bay Lightning hoisted the, the Stanley Cup in their home arena, hoisting it for a second straight year, uh, which happened in July. This is considered probably to be one of the, the shortest off seasons in in the history of the game. How did you follow the the the, the frenzy that, that unfolded the past couple of months? Yeah, I mean, I followed it, but did not like it would be. I didn't really think a lot was going to happen, not like it does in, in normal free agency off seasons, uh, just because the season was so short. You still have the pandemic at a, at a, pretty high level with uh, cases. And I, I just, I think teams are just going to be a little wiser with their money. I and mean, there's still a lot of money spent. I mean, it just seems like money is always there. Uh, but I think teams now are wising up a little bit. And, and I know when I was in Florida, we talked extensively about not getting sucked in on the first day of training camp or first day of free agency, let the, craziness go by and, and see what becomes available because you make a lot of mistakes and, and history has proven that a lot of the big time free agents don't go to their new team and make a huge difference. Uh, maybe once in a while, but at the end of the day, you still have to develop your own draft picks. You got to make wise trades. And um, that's, that's how I think you can build teams for the future. Going after big time free agents, spending a, Whole load of money, I don't think is the wisest way to do things. Then again, each and every year, there are some free agents who might be worth one's money. If you were on a GM seat or if you were on a head coaching seat, how would you have approached uh, the off season, knowing on July 7th, the season ended? And was there, was there a player who you'd like to, to have targeted? Was there a player who you'd have on your radar if you were still a head coach or GM? Yeah. Well, I think from the coaching standpoint, um, and you saw a lot of, I think there was a lot of teams interested in him, but Edmonton was the only one who could really pull it off was Zach Hyman. Um, that's a guy who's got brains. He's got skill. Um, he competes like crazy. Uh, Connor McDavid has even said um, he wants to get to know him as quickly as possible and, and get some chemistry going with him. In the first exhibition game, I think uh, McDavid had a goal and two assists. Hyman had a goal and an assist. So that 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 guy was on everybody's radar. Um, Kenny Holland was probably the, the the one guy that could 
put something together to pull it off and, and get them signed. I know he kept trying to work out a trade and sign agreement, but at the end of the day, he signed him as a, as a free agent and landed a heck of a player. And, and, and Hyman actually was an original Florida Panther draft pick by Dale Talon and his staff back in the day. Uh, so that was a great pick and he is a quality guy. Great story, obviously being a fifth round pick by, by the Panthers back in the day. He signed a seven year contract, um, maxing out at $38.5 million. Good value. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> $38 million over seven years, a lot of money. I mean, who, who really is worth that? But in, in the sports world, that's a number that, um, you know, players are getting. And, and for what that particular player can do for you, if anybody's worth that kind of money, I would say, yes, he's worth it because he's durable. He plays the same way every single night. I mean, there's not too much fall off in his game. Um, He's not afraid to speak to the media when he's approached in the locker room after tough losses. Um, he's just, he's a guy that kind of punches all the holes in a ticket when you're looking for a real solid two-way player. And, that, and that's the key. He's a two-way guy. He can kill penalties. He can, he can play a checking role if you want that. If, if McDavid, and obviously McDavid is going to get the t best line on every single team during the season, Hyman will be the guy that can make the difference because he just grinds it out so much and he's fearless and is in phenomenal shape. So, yeah, I, I, I do think that's well worth the money for him. And he's only 29 years old, so the best years, hopefully, is still ahead for, for Zach Hyman. But as we enter or getting closer to the regular season, what other takeaways or observations did you make during the the off season or now heading into the season well it's funny you know it's a copycat league like uh, most leagues are in pro sports and it's um it's funny how everybody and we did it in florida we went mainly skill and speed even for the fourth line and i remember talking with gerard galant he wasn't a fan of it And, and, I, and I just said, well, listen, we need to make some adjustments because we didn't have four lines to win in the playoffs. So we want to try and, and build up four solid lines that can play. And that was a few years ago. And, and at that time, the thinking was that that's the way the league was going. Um, but over time, and, and Gerard has always stuck to his guns. I think Pete DeBoer is the same way. Uh, Barry Trotz in New, in New York is the same way. They all want to have an element of physical uh players and and that is definitely proven to be a good way to go because um you know vegas had a real good run last year even though they didn't win it they still were a very tough team to play against and i know in vegas that's the way they built their team they and they put more skill in there but they still have an element i was a little surprised when ryan reeves got traded but because i thought he was a huge part of that team and, and gave the guys on that team a lot of freedom but i i think the way the league's going and, and if i was an nhl gm now i definitely would make sure we had an element of toughness because when i coach over here i always like to have that element i kind of got away from that thinking when analytics really took over and i still think you need to have three really good skating lines that can score goals and make plays but that fourth line That can be where your physical style player can play. But, and the reason Reeves is so valuable, you can play him. You, you don't just sit him on the bench and send him out when things get a little silly. Uh, he can actually play 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And that's why I followed what the New York Rangers did so closely, uh, just to see what they were going to do to rebuild their team. Because over the summer, they said they weren't hard enough to play against. Uh, so they changed that. They brought in Ryan Reeves. Um, you know, they, they went out and got Jim Blasey from St. Louis. Uh, so they, they've got an element of grit there now. And, and that's the way Gerard likes to coach. So that's, that's where those are the, that was the one team I paid close attention to them in Seattle. You already kind of, kind of took it away and, and went with it, but that would have been my follow-up question. You knowing Gerard Gallant and, and haven't been able to work with him, would you say there's already a Gallant imprint on the Rangers? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and, and Drury, too, because Drury was a hard-nosed guy to play against. You know, he competed like crazy, so 
it made perfect sense that he went out and got Gerard as his coach. And from day one, Gerard was their number one candidate. I don't think there was anybody else being seriously being seriously considered for that job. And Gerard's done a great job. You know, he's going to be a candidate for coach of the year this year, I'm sure. And um, I think, I think the, well, I know the players absolutely love playing for him. I mean, they did in Florida and that hasn't changed. They did in Vegas. That I mean, when they fired him in Vegas, there was almost mutiny on the bounty there. Everybody was so upset, fans and players. But then that's the impact he has on a team. And we screwed up in Florida, you know, me and, you know, Eric Joyce and Steve Waria, who were the two assistant GMs. We did not, we didn't listen to him enough. Um, and it was a crazy situation there. We, we should have, um, you know, I should have communicated with him a little better than I did. And um, we, we should have had a little bit more physical style player in the lineup. And, and I kicked myself in the rear end from time to time sitting here thinking about it. Because uh, that's the way I always coached. I always liked to have that element myself. And then I kind of got, you know, pulled away from that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I do believe you you definitely need to have a fourth line of guys who can get up and down the ice and play a physical brand. Because that gets the fans excited, gives you bench energy, and and then it protects your skilled guys. You still, you still need to have protection because there is an element of intimidation in the National Hockey League still. Just if you look at the Pat Maroons, the Tyler Johnsons, the Ross Coltons of this world who made up Tampa's fourth line, that's probably the, 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 all the proof you need to, to start building your fourth line on a team. Yeah. And that's a, that's a perfect example. I mean, absolutely perfect. And um, I think the fourth line with the Rangers will obviously be Reeves. Sam Blaze, and uh, I can't remember who the third guy is, but it's um, it's gonna gonna be a player that can skate and get up and down the ice, and, and it will be a pain in the ass to play against. I mean that fourth line for New York, and so that'll be a team. Hopefully, the Austrian uh, market gets to watch the Rangers this year because that will be a fun team to watch. You've already mentioned that he might be one of your candidates for coach of the year. We're gonna uh, make a, a rapid fire round or have a rapid fire round of, of your candidates for most of the NHL awards a little later on this episode. What I wanted to, to get to you or to ask you first is what's your, your gut feel? Is it a good idea to, obviously we're still within a global pandemic, but is it a good good thing to, to go back to the old divisions or did you grow so fond of the, the all Canadian division that you would have loved the NHL to, to stick with the system that they um, implicated last year? Yeah. Providing that you play everybody in the league. I did like the uh, way they had it set up last year. I love the all Canadian division. I think that's awesome. I think the fans liked it in Canada, um, but it, you know, God willing, there's going to be an 82 game schedule this year and there won't be any games canceled. But, um, you know, I think they're starting the league out. Matter of fact, I know they're starting the league out like they did last year. And um, but I, I did like that that format. I thought it was pretty cool. Now, there's a new team, the 32nd team that's joined in the National Hockey League. It's the Seattle Kraken. What should we expect from the newest member of the National Hockey League? Well, you don't have to look far. Just look at Carolina. Ronnie Francis uh, doesn't get enough credit for what he did there, but he built that roster that's so successful today. And I think you're just going to see the same style of player. They'll be their defensemen. And I'll look at just their draft picks from the entry draft this year, amateur entry, entry draft. Mobile guys can move the puck and can skate. And then... The same thing with his forwards. Uh, Ronnie went out and drafted a lot of skill and speed. Um, he's got some good two-way uh, players in the draft that year, but they're, they're all going to be guys that can play and, and that think the game well. He's he's, uh, he's a very meticulous general manager. He, he doesn't leave any stone unturned, but you, you can see the Kraken becoming a very fast-paced puck control move the puck quickly, then we'll not be a dump and chase team. Not one, Maybe initially they might be just because of the way the roster is set up now. But I think over time, you'll see them play a very similar style to Car as Carolina. Um, 
But yeah, that's that that's what Ronnie likes, and that's what that's how he builds his team. What'll be interesting, what we just talked about a couple minutes ago, is if he will bring in a physical element for that fourth line. Will he bring in guys? Because that was the one thing that I thought Carolina got pushed around too much in the beginning of his tenure. They were a little soft. You know, they didn't, you know, once teams started leaning on them and being physical with them, they'd back off a little bit, and that's where you could beat them. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he protects some of those guys with a physical element like a Ryan Reeves, or will he just go the old Detroit Red Wings style and just really bring in four lines of high-end character guys, seven or eight defensemen that just never get intimidated. And we've talked about Alexander Markov. I'll even bring up a player that I coached in in North America, Wayne Simpson, who plays for Engelstadt. Those are guys you just don't get intimidated. You can run at them all night long. They don't get intimidated. So if you have a team toughness attitude like that, and that's the way the Detroit Red Wings were able to dominate for so many years and win so many cups. Yeah, they they had Probert and Joey Koser and those tough guys in the beginning. But as time went on, they got away from that. They had four lines that could play and, and beat you on the scoreboard. And um, if you remember the Anaheim series that Detroit played in, you know, Anaheim tried to beat them up and they could care less. They just fought right through it and they won the series. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see how Ronnie goes. Does he bring in a Ryan Reeves type of player or does he just go after incredibly high character guys that can fight through all the nonsense that happens sometimes? Knowing that you and, and Ron Francis obviously know each other, you've had a relationship or a working relationship for, for quite some time. And and knowing what he tried to do with the Kraken so far, was there a move maybe in free agency, maybe in the expansion draft where you thought typical Ron Francis? Yeah, the goaltender, uh, Grubauer. And uh, I, thought, I thought that was genius. I thought that was a really, that came out of nowhere. Nobody, nobody even um, saw that one coming. So um, that, that was pretty impressive. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that and uh, neither, <laughs> neither did anybody else in the NHL. Because I know, and I haven't talked to Ronnie that much, uh, but he was in a tough position because all the GMs learned from the mistakes they made with Vegas during that expansion draft. And it wasn't as, uh, or I guess there weren't as many moves for Ronnie to make or, or basically hold other teams hostage because George McPhee did hold teams some hostage. Uh, he held some teams hostage, and that's why he was able to put together such an incredible roster. And that's where the pressure is going to come on Seattle. Is Everybody's thinking about what Las Vegas did, and I'm sure the fans in Seattle and management in Seattle are going to expect you know, similar results. So that'll be, uh, I don't think they will have, you know, I think they're going to be competitive. I think they're going to be good, but knowing Ronnie's approach, Ronnie's very methodical and he's very, he's a thinking man. Uh, and, you know, he, he could be a very successful businessman in any other business as well. He will, if ownership is patient with them, they will over time get a really good team there, whether they get one right out of the gates. I'm not so sure yet. Um, uh, because they don't have a lot of offense in that lineup to start in October. Uh, but Ronnie will build the Stanley Cup contender. Within a five-year period, they'll be very dangerous. Wow. Big words. And if it happens, that would be sitting well with the Pacific Northwest. Obviously not with the Vancouver Canucks, but that's a whole, whole different story. Um, as we were talking about Grobauer and him coming in, coming in in free agency, there was this little thing called the expansion draft and, and everybody was looking forward to it. Everybody was curious on who they might settle as regards all the expansion draft picks that, that Seattle made. Was there one that, that stood out for you? Was there one where you said, Ooh, I, I would have taken that specific player as well. Yeah. I'm, I, I mean, not really. It was, it was, I mean, I might get in trouble here when I say this. I just thought it was kind of vanilla ice cream. I didn't get I didn't get overly excited about anybody. I thought he just put together a solid team that his coaching staff could work with. I thought Alexiak from uh, Dallas gave him some size and strength. Um, but yeah, you know, he's got a good roster. Uh, but I, 
I guess with the way the game is today, a little thin on offense and it'll, it'll, de- it'll all determine, you know, how they play as a team. Cause I think if they, if they have four lines that can play and they're all in sync together, then that'll, that'll help. But there's a lot of unknowns because it's a new team and a new city. Uh, Mark Giordano, who I had coached in the American Hockey League his rookie year, is what, uh, without a doubt, I think the best captain in the National Hockey League. He's an amazing leader. He's an amazing person, um, about as good a guy as you're ever going to meet in this business. And he will definitely lead them in the right direction. And he, and he knows what it takes to win. So, you know, getting... To go back and answer your question, when he did pick up Giordano, I said, great move. Absolutely great move. And it was a risky move because Mark had been with Calgary from day one in his uh, career. So, you know, I'm sure they had conversations on the sidelines. You know, if we pick you up in the draft, are you going to come? You know, you you know, and if he says, yeah, I I definitely will come, then you got to do it because that's the type of leader he is. And you'll, Mark will be a guy if he wants to go to work for Seattle when his career is over, he'll be that type of guy that the organization is going to want. So go back a little bit on your first question. Yeah. I, when they picked up Mark Giordano, I said, Whoa, I said, that was a great move. I <laughs> just sit there. I kind of forgot he was even there until it just came back into my mind. Uh, so yeah, that would be the the pick that I would have made uh, because you need to have strong leadership and you need to have a strong locker room which is what George McPhee did such a phenomenal job with in Vegas. They had unbelievable chemistry. See, I never want to counter anything that former GM and head coach in the National Hockey League says, but to me, that one pickup that I would have probably gone for and Seattle did was Yanni Gord. Obviously coming from a Stanley Cup champion back-to-back, winning a lot of face-offs, undrafted, so he's got that chip on his shoulder. He's He's... Deceptively fast, and right. and he scored a lot, and right. just all all the all the pieces that I would be looking for for in a player. But but obviously that's that's me. But from an offensive standpoint, how would you assess Yanni Gord being on the Kraken? Yeah, I mean Yanni Gord's a great player, and I loved him on Tampa Bay. But here here's where I'll counter that a little bit is Johnny Gord was never counted on to be the big scoring guy in Tampa Bay. You know, he was a support guy. And there are a lot of players like that. So now it's going to be a little different because Johnny Gord is a very emotional player from watching him on the ice. How is he going to handle the spotlight in Seattle? Because this Seattle, the spotlight's definitely going to be on him because one of how he plays. So he's going to draw a lot of attention. He's going to aggravate a lot of teams. Um, when he was in Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay, just skated by everybody and he was a support guy, but now he's going to, you know, he's going to be counted on to maybe pick up another five to six goals in total over the course of the season. And it's going to all come down to, and I don't know other than watching him on TV, it's all going to come down on how he handles that uh, bigger role. Cause he is going to have a bigger role and he had a big role in Tampa Bay, but he'll have a an extremely big role in the locker room and on the ice and in practice, because I know that their coach, Dave Hoxtall does a great job. He'll demand good practice habits. So it all depends how he handles all that stuff. And and he's a great pickup. And and I thought he was a good pickup, but I, you know, I just said, okay, that makes sense. Um, But it all depends. And, And some guys can handle it when they go to a different organization and they want that bigger role. So time will tell how he handles it when he goes to Seattle. That is why you are the expert, and I'm just uh, the guy asking <laughs> yeah. the question. But to to conclude the the Seattle topic, do you think the the Vegas Magic Carpet ride can be kind of replicated in the Pacific Northwest? Is there is it thinkable that Seattle might just go on to the Stanley Cup Finals? No, I mean now. Ronnie Francis may not like me anymore after this podcast and our, and our wives are extremely tight. They're very, very tight. So I got to be careful, but no, I do not see, you know, I could be proven wrong, but I do not see Seattle doing what Las Vegas did. Um, I just don't see it. I mean, Vegas, you talk about the perfect storm. They had everybody going. They built that team with, uh, with skill and grit 
I don't, I just don't see as much grit with Seattle right now. Uh, maybe they pick it up over time. Who knows? Uh, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening. I do think they'll be competitive. I, I think they'll have a chance to get in the playoffs for sure. And I think if, if they can get into the playoffs, I think they're going to look at that as being successful, but to go to the Stanley cup finals, like Vegas did, uh, I don't, I don't see it. I really don't. And then again, stranger things have happened. And this is why we all love sports and hockey in particular. Uh, coach, I got a lot of listeners feedback and a lot of listeners questions. And I want to tackle a couple of them as, as we progress in, um, in this episode and, and with this conversation. And one listener had probably the most interesting question of the off season for me. He wanted to know how you would have dealt with the, the, Kane's offer sheet for Jesperi Kokaniemi. If you were a Montreal GM, if you were Marc Bergevin, was that the, the ultimate poison pill that the Hurricanes put out? Yeah, it, it, I got to laugh because the Hurricane said it wasn't any revenge. Um, from the, from the from Ajo, the yeah. Ajo, yeah. Sh sure, it wasn't any revenge. That, if you believe that, I got a bunch of swamp land in New York to sell you. But um There, there is no doubt, and I don't care what Don Well that Waddell says, that was definitely a revenge move. Maybe not by Donnie, but certainly by the owner. Uh, how I would have dealt with it, I guess, there's a couple of things you got to look at. Um, where, where, where was your salary cap? Were you right up against it and you couldn't afford to match it? And you say, okay, let's just take the draft picks. Uh, the kid was pretty upset when um, Coach Ducharme scratched him from a couple of games in the playoffs. So now, how how disruptive was that in the locker room? Was there so much of an issue and so much of a so much dissension after that? Did you just have to cut them loose? So there's a lot of different variables. If you're up against the salary cap and you can't, you don't have any moves, um, then I guess you just got to take the draft picks. But I think a young kid like that who's got some good skill, I would have tried everything to move out a couple of veteran guys or a couple of players who were coming at the end of their career, maybe give up a draft pick um, or two to keep them and make, make room for them within the salary cap. Because uh, I think you got 6 million bucks. You were going to have to, you know, offer, you're going to have to honor the offer sheet. So I don't know. You just, I don't think you ever want to give away or let a young kid walk out the door, but I don't, I guess we don't really know all the, circumstances going on behind the scene and you know unless you're a fly in the wall there you're never going to know what really happened but you know but I, I think most gms would would match it and then you have x amount of time to get to the salary cap number and then try and move a couple of other players out and uh, go that route that's how i would have done it not specifically targeting Jesperi kokanyemi who's been up and down in his NHL career. He's just 22, uh, 21 years old still. He's the third overall draft pick from 2018. How many years do you give a prospect in the league or how many years do you want to see him until you start to think about potentially moving on? Yeah, I think a guy drafted that high and that skilled, and again, the beauty of analytics, the analytics will give you some of that picture. Um, they'll know them inside and out character wise from their coaches, you know, being with them every single day of the week. Um, I, I don't, I think you got to be patient and, um, you know, wait three, four or five years for a guy like that to break through. Because Ajo, Sebastian Ajo in Carolina, he didn't light the world on fire right out of the gate. And, and that's where Ronnie Francis is so good. He's extremely patient. You know, you're never going to, you are never going to push him into a move that he doesn't want to make. Um, and that's where a player like that, where if Montreal could have been a little more patient, you know, why wouldn't you mat match that offer? So I think, but again, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes with the kid. Is he, you know, is he so disruptive in the locker room? They just wanted to move away from him. Did they look at the draft coming up where they have those draft picks now that they, oh yeah, we, we, we project this kid that we see potentially available he'll be ready in a year or two. So there's, there's a lot, but I, I don't think you can give up on a good, young, skilled guy, especially the way the game's going today. I don't know, five years for me would be the magic number. 
But then again, if we look at it from Carolina's point of view, obviously having some revenge at the Montreal Canadiens expense, but with Sebastian Aho, with uh, Toivo uh, Teravainen, and of course with Antti Ranta, three Finns on the Hurricanes. You think that not problem with Jesperi Kokoniemi, but uh, you think it's gonna gonna um, take care of itself? Just having all those Finns on on the roster already, who who will uh, talk to or, or get get Kokoniemi game ready or or more ready than he was maybe in Montreal? Yeah, I know I do because um, the I'll just use Sebastian Aho and Teravine and especially Aho. He's grown up there. He's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly there. And now he's he's with um, Rod Brendamore, who's an amazing motivator. Amazing. Probably the best in the league. Uh, an incredible communicator. And if Rod wasn't there, uh, if it was a different style coach, then, yeah, I think they might have some concerns. But not with Roddy. Roddy's as consistent as they come across the board, holds everybody accountable. He's not a screamer and a yeller. He's just very, very communicative. If he doesn't like what you're doing, he's going to sit you down in a very calm way, explain why he doesn't like it and give you things to work on to change or tell you this is the way we do it here. Um, so, yeah, I think he'll fit in fine. And the fact that they have, you know, Three fans there. I don't think that's an issue. I mean, it's a global sport. You got to have players from whoever their best players are got to be on your roster. You know, God, Detroit had a lot of their roster was Swedish, and they, they and Russians, and they, they did pretty good for themselves. So, Roddy, Roddy's a special person. Um, has done an amazing job with that organization. Has set a culture in that organization that. Everybody, and I mean everybody, is following. When you have guys like Benny Trocek coming out, and Benny Trocek's not a real coach-friendly type of player. I coached him in the minors. He's a good kid, but he'll he'll buck he'll buck you every inch of the way. And Benny Trocek came out and said this off season that he'll run through the wall for Roddy Brindle. I've never heard Benny say that about any coach he's ever had, myself included. He maybe wanted to run through some of us coaches, but uh, that that that's uh, that speaks volumes from Roddy Brindle. Obviously, reigning a Jack Adams Trophy winner, Rod Brindamore. And um, yeah, interesting to see what's going to happen with Jesperi Kokonyemi with the Carolina Hurricanes. A couple more listener questions that, that came in. And one interesting observation and interesting question attached to it. As we've seen these huge contracts for blue line defensemen or defensemen in, in general, like, who are going to play on your first pair probably with uh, Seth Jones, with Dougie Hamilton, or the extensions to uh, Kiel Makar and, and, and Hiskinen. Is that trend, I'd call it, going to continue? Or is it just, or was this offseason just the exception to the rule? Well, I, I, it'll continue for the elite defensemen like those guys. You know, if, if you've got a defenseman like Makar, I'll use him as an example because I think he's going to be the best defenseman in the league very shortly, then, yeah, you're going to have to pay those guys. Um, Dougie Hamilton, not so sure I would have paid that kind of money for him, um, but he is he is productive and he, he can run your power play. Uh, but when you have a young stud like Makar, like Jones, like Heskinen, Yeah, you've got to pay those guys. But if, if you don't have that elite level, and I mean a guy that's going to be your number one defenseman, it's not even any question. He's going to be your number one defenseman for 10 years, 12 years. Um, yeah, I think you do have to pay those guys because they you, kind of like quarterbacks in the National Football League. Uh, they just don't come around too often. Not like that anyway. I mean, watch him a car. In his first year, and I know his coach real well, his former college coach, Greg Carville, really well. And I called Greg and I said, Greg, I said, man, oh, man, this guy is, looks like he's been in the NHL for 10 years. He said, yeah. And he said, it's no mistake. He said he doesn't get rattled. He said he's only going to get better. And, um, you know, he, he just said he he is legit. And it's just amazing what that kid can do. So, yeah, you know, if you're going to back up the uh, Brinks truck with all the money in it, then those are the types of guys who are going to get it. 
And of course, said um, Greg Carvel graced this podcast as well. Yeah, and, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. And and of course, there is another Makar coming in. And guess who is playing for? <laughs> yeah, UMass. And Greg told me that. He, you may, maybe he's not like the brother, but he's still going to be pretty good, I bet. Maybe just maybe this is the right point in time to remind listeners out there this that there is a Taylor Makar probably not too far away from the start of his NHL career. But would you say the gold standard for NHL defenseman as of right now is Kale Makar? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean absolutely. Uh, you, you're not going to find many with that talent because his talent is oh my god, it's it's amazing, you know. I don't want to get too crazy using comparisons, but who he can skate like Bobby Orr. He sees the how you know he sees the ice like Bobby Orr. I mean, he gets up and down uh, the ice like nothing. I mean, he he can be in in the offensive and deep into the offensive end, and then be back in the defensive zone and probably beat most guys back up ice. Every time you're mentioned in the same breath as Bobby Orr, something special might be happening and Kim McCarr indeed is a special kind of talent. One last question as regards listeners having a say in this podcast and on this episode um, is an interesting one as well because one of the listeners wanted to know why it is that restricted free agents like Rasmus Dahlin or Kirill Kaprizov, um, Quinn Hughes, Elias Patterson or Brady Kachuk were or are still hesitant to sign extensions. Is it an anomaly or is it something bigger that's that's going on here i what it is is the agents understand that they've got leverage the the uh, and the agents just string it out so when rasmus darling uh got got uh signed finally because that had been going on for quite a while i use him as an example and he's represented by donnie Mann, who's probably one of the best agents in the business Top five anyway. And I dealt with that agency when I was in Florida. They they like to drag things out as far as they can take it. And, and that's what goes on. And that's their job. That's what they should be doing. You know, if you're you and I have got a son in the National Hockey League like Darlene, you damn right you're gonna want him to get as much money as possible. And and that's what a good agent does. So I, I think that's what it is, is the agents are dragging this out to the to as far as they possibly can go and squeeze out as much money as they possibly can without giving up a lot of years. And I, and I think that's personally and, and deal with these agents and, and most of them are real, really good guys, regardless of what you hear about them. Um, but that's their job. And then that's what I think is going on with Kachuk, with Dolly and all these guys. It's, it's not that they don't want to go back to their team. And I know a lot of people probably said, well, I'll, Maybe Darlene doesn't want to be in Buffalo. He definitely wants to be in Buffalo. Darlene, Cousins, Middlestat, all those young guys, that's what they're building the team around now. And, uh, you know, and it's been very public, so I'm not saying anything that I shouldn't be. But, you know, Jack Eichel, you know, is not, you know, he's not the leader of that club anymore. It's all those young guns, and, and they're going to try and build around those young guns. And, and have a successful team because if, if Buffalo gets back on the map and gets into the playoffs, my God, there's not going to be a tougher building to play in than Buffalo. It's a brutal place to go play when they're flying around there. We'll talk about a couple of things that you already mentioned a little later on, on this episode, but as you are at, at the very least, that's my impression. One of the most composed coaches and, and GMs that, that I know how hard Is it to keep one's composure when you're negotiating with agents and negotiations are going on and dragging on and dragging on and going on? Is it is it is it easy or is it too easy to lose one's cool or or am I mistaken right here? No, I, no. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and, and I'm not always the most composed guy in the world. But when I was a GM. And we were negotiating, and, and uh, Alexander Barkov is probably the best example I can give you. Uh, Todd Diamond was his agent. Him and Mark Gandler, uh, the agents for Alexander Barkov. That was a that was a long drawn out process. But I can honestly tell you, it never got tense. It, um, obviously, we knew we wanted 
Alexander back and we knew we were going to have to pay money to get him back on a long-term deal, but it was, it was very professional. A lot of give and take back and forth. Now, they were smart. They, you know, they signed him right up until I think he's got two more years left on that contract. And, and I said to the ownership group, I said, listen, what they're going to do is they're going to bring him right up to free agency when he's going to not even be 30. And I said, then there's going to be a major league bidding war for him. And when he becomes a free agent, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that he, unless they're winning Stanley Cups in Florida, which they could be at that point. And he says his agent, no, I don't want to go anywhere but Florida. You, you could potentially see another John Tavares uh, bidding war going on. Um, so that's, that's and, and you you just got to remain calm and patient, which I'm not always known for doing. Uh, but when I was in the box watching games from a GM's perspective, I never got I never got upset. I just kind of watched it and stayed really calm. On the bench as a coach, it's a little different sometimes. Uh, you're, you're flipping out inside internally. I would say outwardly, I was more um, emotional in the American Hockey League. And then as you mellow when you get older, you, you kind of calm down a little bit. But no, it's just, it, it, you know, going in when you're dealing with these agents, they're going to they're gonna try and get under your skin and, and they're going to, they always have a higher value than what the player's worth or most of the time. And then we always have, we always want to get it obviously a little bit less on the management side, but it's the business and you just got to, you got to be cool about it. Did a very good job um, of, of hiding your more 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 heated outgoing <laughs> side in Austria. Yeah, obviously. Ask my ask my wife how come I get. <laughs> we'll do it at some point, Coach. Um, forty five minutes down of talking about the National Hockey League. Obviously, a hundred different topics that we could tackle, but two very hot ones for Austrian fans coming up. Right after a break, we're going to talk about the Dallas Stars, about the Minnesota Wild. The two teams where we hope to have Austrians on a squad. All of that and more upcoming after this break. Du hörst und schätzt Hockey O'Clock mit Martin Pfanner und bist noch dazu Unternehmerin oder Unternehmer? Dir ist es wichtig, in einem Eishockey-Umfeld deine Inhalte punktgenau an den Mann oder die Frau zu bringen? Dann sind die vielfältigen und maßgeschneiderten Werbemöglichkeiten bei Hockey O'Clock vielleicht genau das Richtige für dich und deine Marke. Alle Infos zu Werbeformen und Sonderwerbeformen, Buchung oder Preisen gerne auf Anfrage an Hockey O'Clock 101 at gmail.com Das ist Hockey O'Clock 101.gmail.com Back on Hockey O'Clock, back with Austria's favorite National Hockey League pundit. It's none other than still coach and GM Tom Rowe, formerly of the Florida Panthers. Coach, um, on the first part of the episode, we were talking about the bigger storylines, about broader things. Now I want to get down to the nitty gritty and talking about two um, specific teams where we hope that Austrians will be playing this year. Obviously the Minnesota Wilds uh, with Marco Rossi and of course the Dallas Stars now with Michael Ruffle. I want to start with the Minnesota Wild who are coming off a playoff campaign um, who lost very narrowly against uh, Las Vegas or the Vegas Golden Knights. How would you assess the the past wild campaign? Success that came too early to a rebuilding squad? No, I don't think it came too early. I thought, I thought Billy Guerin did a great job of making some changes there, moving players out. Um, it would, I thought it would, took a lot of courage to do what he did with Parisi and, and Suter. Uh, that's that's not easy, but he had to change the chemistry. They were they were leaning too much on those two guys, and and I thought Dean Evison, who I was happy to see get the job full time there, because he certainly paid his dues as an assistant in the National Hockey League and the head coach in the American Hockey League. But no, I don't think they. I think they're did they overachieve probably a little bit, uh, but now I think I think what Garen and Evison wanted to do is set expectations higher and send the message to the organization. Uh, throughout the players' room 
at the minor league level and the National Hockey League level and to the fans that we're here to win a Stanley Cup and that we do have a certain standard that we want to meet. And I, I thought that's what was so good for them last year. They were able to accomplish that. For them to do what they did um, during the regular season and then to play as well as they did in the playoffs, I, I think to a man, they'd probably say, yeah, they didn't see that coming. Um, but give Garen credit and give Everson credit for leading the way. And they're both, both high-end character guys and they played. Um, and that's the way they want their team to play. And the fact that, and, and I absolutely love this, when Everson had the courage to scratch Parisi, I thought that was an unbelievable message to send everybody. And good for Dean for doing that, because I think that um, – that, that was probably one of the most important uh, decisions he could have made as a coach in his first year. And it's not easy, you know, and I'm sure, you know, there was a lot of disgruntled uh, conversations going on behind the scenes. But when things aren't going and your big guns aren't producing, you know, you got to send a message one way or another. And, and Dean had the courage to do it and good for Billy Guerin for backing him up on it. Now, if we talk about floor and, and and ceiling the floor after a playoff campaign probably needs to be another playoff run or a playoff qualification again but what's the ceiling for the minnesota wild as it stands right now i think uh get out of the first round and i think again if if they ever get out of the second round say you go to the conference finals that would be amazing but i you know each year make some progression because what you're going to want to do, and I'm sure they're going to want to be doing this, um, is they're going to want to get Marco Rossi into the into the lineup this year. Now, he's coming off a tough season last year with COVID and everything that he went through. But the, I remember because I used to have his agent, Pat Poloni, and Pat used to tell me how good he was. And I started watching when I was in Lens, I would watch his games on video when he was playing in Ottawa. And I'm saying, oh, my God. I said, this kid's got eyes in the back of his head. And and that's – and, again, that's – we talked earlier. That's what I get excited about. You know, I can't wait to watch Minnesota play now if he's in the lineup because I just want to see what he can do against the National Hockey League defensemen and, and against National Hockey League teams And because he is a talent. And I do think he's going to be unbelievable. So um, – I do think they're going to have another good year. And again, I'll go back to the standard that's been met there and the fact that they were, they moved out, they bought out those two huge contracts. Um, I think that breathes, and it's not a knock on the two players that got bought out. It just breathes, breathes a little bit of life into that organization. And now guys who maybe weren't getting big minutes on the back end are going to start getting more minutes because Suter's gone. The same thing with Parisi. Parisi's gone. So now other younger forwards are going to get more minutes and, and that's what will be exciting to watch. But I think if they get into the second round, regardless if they win the second round, I, I think, again, you're making some, um, you're making baby steps going forward, but you're making them in the right direction. One of the bigger headlines of uh, this offseason was obviously the, the contract status of the reigning Calder Memorial uh, Trophy winner, Kirill Kaprizov. And obviously they came to terms he signed a big extension um uh, the other day is is caprizos contract extension after just quote unquote one good year in a national hockey league a good deal or is it bias beware i think i think it's a good deal because he he played at a very high level in russia right i mean it's not like he uh you know as a total unknown he's a little bit older he's i think he's 25 uh from 24. the state 24. Okay. Um, so it's not like he's, if you're a 19, 20 year old getting 9 million, unless you're Austin Matthews, uh, then yeah, buyer beware. But the, I mean, you saw him play last year. I mean, I, I couldn't believe what he did. I mean, he, again, he made plays that were amazing. So yeah, at 25 years old, you got to step up and, and that's probably a huge reason why they bought out the two contracts that they bought out because they wanted to have money without strapping themselves financially for this young kid and knowing that they got Rossi coming right behind now Rossi, they won't have to do that kind of contract with him if he has the same success for a few more years, but they're eventually going to have to do it. If, if he is successful as everybody's hoping he will be, uh, but no, I don't, I don't think it's buyer beware. I thought it was, 
<laughs> we were talking about it on the golf course, a couple of my buddies. And I mean, you got to remember, I'm in South Carolina with a bunch of rednecks. And then a couple of them have turned into uh, pretty good hockey fans. And uh, the fact that they're Trump supporters, I won't hold against them. But they even asked me, they said, uh, $9 million for a rookie? And, and I said, yeah, but he's not a normal rookie. He's 24, 25 years old. So I said, he's a, he's a great player that they're going to have. They will build their team around. And they already are building that team around him. Would it be okay next time around to just provide you with some kind of recording device and you recording the conversations that go on on the golf course and put it, <laughs> put it, put it them on a pod or, or, or would, 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 it be, yeah. would it get some kind of rating? Uh, yeah, it would get some kind of rating because Trump names come up a lot. I'm not a Trump supporter. They all are. You got to remember, I live in the South where Trump is gold. <laughs> We're not gonna dive into into uh, politics uh, yeah, right here. God. I want to <laughs> I want to <laughs> remain with the Wild a little bit. If you look at their roster right now, what's their biggest strength, and where do you think there are still holes that could be or have to be plucked, maybe at at the trade deadline? Yeah, I still think they could use a couple more defensemen, you know, a couple of guys in the five, six spot, you know, might be a little bit thin there. I wouldn't say they're drastically thin there, but a little bit. Um, and, and then again, uh, I, I like what they got up front, but again, yet a little, it's always um, easier to fill the third and fourth line roles because you can go out and get those guys through free agency. You've got to be able to draft your, for a second line guys, and then they got to be able to move in and, and produce pretty quick. You know, Greenway's done a great job there. Uh, they got Rossi coming in. I'm sure they're hoping like heck he, he steps in and, and has an impact. Um, but again, I, I think you shore up the third and fourth line because those are the, that's the easier part of the roster to make better quicker. And then just hope you're developing people and your coaching staff for bringing those top end young kids along as quickly as possible. And, and just, you got to let those guys go play and they're going to make their mistakes and they're going to be some nights they lose the game for you. Uh, but by Christmas time, usually if the job's been done properly and Dean Everson's a great development de developer of young guys, you know, usually by Christmas, you start seeing teams take off. So yeah, I, I would say they probably need to shore up three, third and fourth line a little bit in their fifth and sixth defenseman. Now, Rossi is currently with the rookies. He made an impact already with the AHL's Iowa Wild in preseason. And knowing that he's one of the more interesting center prospects the Wild have had in quite some time, you know you've got a potential generational talent at your hand. You know he's coming off a, a tough season where COVID really, really struck him And, and what COVID potentially set him back. How careful would you would you personally be with inserting him into your lineup? And 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 if so, where would you start putting him? I'd be real careful, and I'd probably start him in the American Hockey League um, because if you move him in too quick, let's just say they don't get off to a great start. And players are cranky, coaches are cranky. It's not a good environment in the locker room. Fans are upset, bad media. Say Marco comes in and doesn't get out of the gate real quick. You know, they don't care that he's only a 20 year old kid. There's going to be criticism there in the media. So why put him through that? Let him go down to Iowa where nobody's going to know anything about him. You know, he's not going to get a ton of media attention. He can, he can develop under a real good coach. Timmy Army's the uh, head coach down there with a lot of experience. Great guy, really good with young kids. And let him go down there. Let him go down there for a month, month and a half. And when things are positive, if now if Minnesota's gotten off to a real good start, everybody's happy, the locker room's positive, um, then, yeah, bring him up and let's see what he can do. Get, you know, put him in. But when you bring him up, you can't put him on the fourth line. When you bring him up, he's got to go into a top six, well, at least top nine role. He's got to be at least on the third line where he's getting some good minutes and creating some offense. Because the biggest thing to worry about is if you're in a locker room with some disgruntled players and they're miserable and pissed off about whatever, 
that can drag down a young kid and a young, and it's tough enough uh, for young kids to crack into the national hockey league. And, uh, and you need to make sure, and this is what Garen and Everson are doing. They're surrounding these players with good veteran guys. Like they, they've got some real quality veteran guys there. So I'm sure it's going to be a positive atmosphere there. Tampa Bay. I read an article yesterday about Tampa Bay. The veteran players on that team are going out of their way to make all the young kids coming into training camp feel comfortable and wanted. And that's huge. And too many times those young kids don't get treated properly or they don't aren't given the time of day. And that's the trouble you run into. So Marco's going to be in the NHL, no doubt about it. But I wouldn't rush him. You got to be patient. And it's easier said than done sometimes. Just wanted to ask, if you were a betting man, Marco Rossi on the opening day roster, yes or no? No. Well, we're going to find out if he's going to be on the opening day roster. I think it's going to be on Friday against the Anaheim Ducks. Another interesting topic, Coach, that we haven't tackled yet with the Minnesota Wild is that they're going to be participating in the new Discover Winter Classic of the National Hockey League. Do you think it's an advantage having something to be looking forward to during the re the regular season or is it going to be a distraction no i think i think it's awesome that you know the league's doing that and i think the players absolutely love being involved in that game um i know if i was a player i'd, I'd really want to be in a game like that and it just gives you something to look forward to and there are some days that are Man, oh man, and these guys are getting paid a lot of money, but a lot of times money never even comes into the equation when it comes to playing the game. They just want to be successful and, and win and, and be in the playoffs. But there, there are some days where you beat up and you're sore and, you know, and um, it can be a grind. But if you have that to look forward to, the National Hockey League's done an amazing job promoting that particular series of games. Yeah, I mean, it gives the players something to look forward to. I, I don't think it's a distraction. If anything, I think it's a huge help, huge boost. Going to take place on January the 1st, as always, and it's also going to take place on Pulse24, not only hopefully with Marco Rossi, but also with the former St. Louis Blues goalkeeper, Reinhard Divis, who's now an expert on the Pulse24 team. And of course, the St. Louis Blues are going to be the Minnesota Wilds opponent. So, so a lot to be looking forward to. Another club coach I wanted to talk uh, to you about are obviously the Dallas Stars, where we don't know yet when, when and where Marco Rossi will make his debut as a Wild. We're fairly confident that uh, Michael Raffa will make his debut for the Dallas Stars on, on opening day. And as we talk about the, the Stars, we are probably talking about one of the bigger disappointments of the past campaign as they just made the Stanley Cup Finals the year prior. Is Dallas the team with the biggest or maybe among the biggest bounce back potential teams? Yeah, I mean, they're a funny team because you never know quite what you're going to get sometimes. I mean, they got Pavelski, they got Ben. Um, you know, they've got a lot of good players, but they, they're definitely a think defense first type of team. And I, and I think, um, If you just kind of let them run and gun a little bit, you know, you're still going to have enough defense in your game to, to win. So uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how these new signings that they've made raffle being more of a defensive grinding type of a forward. You know, they went out and got Glenn Denning, who again is another checker type guy. You know, they're going to be very strong down the middle with the guys they have playing center. Um, so Yeah, I mean, they could bounce back or they, they you know, they could stay fairly flat. You just don't know. It's a, Jimmy Nill is a great executive, does a real good job. Rick Bonus, I know the guys love playing for him. Um, so you, you've, the chemistry will be there. It just depends on Pavelski and Ben um, and how those players uh, perform. They get Heskin in on the back end, so they're very mobile. You know, they, they, they've got the horses just depends on how they all put it together and how they come out of the gates. 
Now, coming off a Stanley Cup uh, final campaign and then missing the playoffs, and obviously they had a year from hell with a lot of players uh, haven't been uh, in, in COVID quarantine when the season started. Did it surprise you that they held on to Rick Bonnes? Uh Well, I think that, that they, they held on to him because of the relationship he has with the players. And in today's game, uh, you got to get the players to play for you. And Rick's really good at it. Rick's very similar to Gerard Gallant, very similar type of coach, uh, similar type of player when they both played. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, as a former coach and a, and a guy waiting for the next gig, I, I was happy that Jimmy Nill uh, held on to Rick. because uh, Rick, and I know Rick, because we played against each other. He's a great guy, real quality person. And, and players will – run through the wall for him. Now he's been a head coach of the national hockey league before he's been an assistant coach for a long time. So he knows what the drill is, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised. He'll, he'll probably lean on some guys a little harder this year, uh, knowing that they've got to get back into the playoff picture. But no, it was, I thought it was a real good decision. Jimmy Neal knows what he's got there and the players like him. And at the end of the day, if you don't get the players to play for you, forget it. You're not going to last long. We were talking about the Wilds' floor and ceiling. Where do you think Dallas's floor and ceiling are? Uh, playoff team, for sure. Conference finals. I think they, they got enough to get to the conference finals. What they do after that is going to depend on their goaltending. And interestingly enough, you, of course, brought up the goaltending just as I was about to, to ask you about it. There's Bishop, there's Holpe, there's Kudaban, there's Ottinger. Who's going to be number one in your estimation? Wow. <laughs> well, uh, hope he's won a cup. He's probably tired of getting kicked around. I would, I would put my money on him. Now, whether he can keep it all year remains to be seen. But I think the system that Dallas plays is going to benefit him and he'll know exactly where all the shots are coming from on a regular basis. And I do still think he's a good goaltender, regardless of what's happened. Um, Vancouver was a tough year for him and everybody else. Uh, but no, I, I would, I'd put my money on Holpe. If you take a look at the, the roster top to bottom, what's the biggest strength going to be for the Dallas stars in the upcoming campaign? For me, they're back end. You know, they're, they're, I think they got some pretty good defensemen back there. Nice get in, lug, lugs it on a regular basis, logs a lot of minutes. So, yeah, I, and again, you've got a system in place that's defense first there. So I do think that's where, I think that's where their strength is going to be. And if Holpe can reform, get his form back to where it used to be, then you'll, you'll have a, a real tough team to play against. Because when, when they're playing and they're on their game, um, there's not a lot of ice out there to be had. And they, especially when their forwards are tracking back into the defensive zone, helping the defense, you have very little time to make a play. Now for Austrian viewers and, and listeners, obviously of importance is that uh, Michael Raffer is now a member of the Dallas Stars. If, you look at his career trajectory, what he's done, uh, where he helped out, how many different roles he played, like Cinnamon, Wing, played on the first line, played on the second line, played on a fourth line, which uh, was basically his daily, daily bread last year. Where do you figure he's going to play in Dallas? I think he'll probably be with Glenn Denning. It'll be because they're going to want to use four lines a lot. But he'll be, he'll be a guy that they can move up to a top six role because he's so smart and he competes and he's not afraid to use his body. Um, but I, I would think if everybody's healthy and given um, what they've got, uh, you know, and they, I would say no more than third line, but he might even end up on the fourth line just to solidify that fourth line so you can just send four lines out. But if they, they shorten the bench – and they've got to only go with three lines, I definitely could see Rick Bonus moving him up into a role. That, that's the beauty of him. Um, you can basically play him in you want in the lineup. 
And like I told you last year when I was in Florida, we tried to get him in a trade a few times and Philly, we just never trade him. Uh, but he's a heck of a player. I know guys like him a lot and he's, he's a mucker and a grinder and, and he competes and he, he's definitely a guy you can win a Stanley Cup with for sure. Now, as we tackled the two teams where Austrians hopefully are going to play in 21-22, we're going to turn our attention to a rapid fire round of you picking a couple of the most important awards in the National Hockey League. And because of you already raving about Kale McCarr, is it a given that he's going to win a Norris Trophy? I think so. I think he could have, you know, there was some discussion about him last year. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely put him right at the top of my list. Your pick for the President's Trophy in this upcoming season, which Anita goes to the team with the most points after the regular season. Wow. That's, uh, I'll go with Colorado again, um, because I think they learned a lot last year. And then they got, they got a coach that's won a championship at every single level. Um, East Coast Hockey League, American Hockey League, and um He is a heck of a coach, but no matter how good he is as a coach, he's got some unbelievable players with McKinnon and McCarr, just to mention two guys off the top. But I know I'll, I'll go President's Trophy with uh, Colorado, and I also got him as a Stanley Cup winner. And I know it's probably not fair putting you on the spot, knowing that it's an 82-game season, that it's, of course, a marathon, not a sprint, and that so many things could happen. But it's always fun to... to project and, and then at the season's end to, to go back to some of the projections and see how they fared, how they turn out. And, and of course, you being the expert, I expect nothing less than them being spot on, like all of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. 2021-2022 <laughs> Hart Memorial Trophy winner, which annually goes to the league's most valuable player. I think Toronto is taking so much um, abuse and rightfully so because they haven't lived up to their expectations but they still have an amazing team I'll go with uh, Austin Matthews because I think he's getting to the point where he's tired of hearing all the critics about him in the playoffs and even though that's based on the regular season I, I think he's coming in with a real uh, agenda and I think he's going to be extremely um, determined this year and I think he's grown up quite a bit over the last few years and I, and I think he's going to be a hard trophy winner this season Going from the forwards to the very back, it is the Vezina Trophy, which annually goes to the league's best goaltender. Who do you think that's going to be in 2021-2022? Yeah, I, even though I didn't agree with how Kucherov handled himself after they won the Stanley Cup last year, his post-game comments, I do agree with him that uh, Vasilevsky, I think, is a Vezina Trophy winner for sure. So, He's an amazing goalie. He's big. He's he's flexible as anybody in the game and just comes up with big save after big save. So I think um, if John Cooper didn't have Vasilevsky in that, John Cooper would probably have a lot of sleepless nights. But with him in that, he probably sleeps real comfortable. And maybe even a new job. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Call it Memorial Trophy for the best rookie in the National Hockey League. Yeah. Well, I got two guys, and I mentioned Rossi last year. Uh, but again, um, you know, he's going to need to get his game back into shape. But I still have one on the list. But uh, Cole Caulfield in Montreal, I think, you know, with what he did in the playoffs, just stepping right in the way he did and knowing the league a little bit better, I'm going to go with him. And, and, you know, I think he's a – I do think he's a game breaker, and he can – certainly put the wins up in the column for you because he can finish and is a, and I think he likes that pressure a lot. So I'll, I'll go with Caulfield as a call to trophy winner. My favorite award of them all. And for, for some people's tastes, they're probably one or two too many, but I like the Selkie trophy, which annually goes to, the best defensive forward in the National Hockey League. And the reigning Selkie Trophy recipient is none other than Alexander Barkov, uh, whom you coached as well. Is he going to be the favorite for another Selkie or is there someone else on your radar? No, I, I think um, 
it was good that he won it because I know last year I picked Felino because you look at all the analytics and all the numbers. Felino did a great job in uh, Minnesota. But Barkov is probably going to be the next Patrice Bergeron and do everything. And, and, and Patrice Bergeron had a pretty good run with that. Um, so I think Alex can definitely uh, win it again and, and could win it and will win it multiple times before his career is over. I mean, it's just – I just love the guy. I just he's so professional and he's just so good of a hockey player. And if he was in New York media market, not down in Florida where nobody really gets any attention, you know, this guy would be in every single newspaper article written about hockey in New York. So, you know, I, I do think that Barca will win it again. Just to double check, because you said Rod Brindamore is going to be one of the favorites, if not the favorite to win coach of the year. Is he going to double down on a, on his already or on the Jack Adams trophy that is already owning? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I love, I had three guys, Adams for the Adams trophy, Cooper, Brenda Moore and Gallant. Gerard always has good history in the first year with the club, but uh, I am going with Brenda Moore here because I think Brad will probably do the best job that he's had since he started coaching Carolina this year because Hamilton's gone. Uh, I think that's going to rave. That's going to get his juices going again, because I'll guarantee you he's been planning every night and day in the office with his coaching staff. You know, how are we going to take the next step with this group? He's got some new guys in there. Right. Um, and, and I'm just telling you, I know Roddy and I know him really well from when I coached there when he was still a player. This guy's a special guy. And I, and I think he's going to he'll get him over the top. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, if they're in the Stanley Cup finals. Speaking about getting them over the top, you already named your Stanley Cup um, champion, prospective one with the Colorado Avalanche. And as we're going back to the conferences system, Colorado coming out of the Western Conference. Is it Carolina that's coming out of the, the Eastern Conference or is there someone else uh, you're, you're having on your radar right now? No, I mean, in the East, it's there's so much parity. I mean, there's parity all over the National Hockey League, but I think in the East a little bit more just because there's so many uh, teams that can beat you any night. Uh, Bruce Cassidy's done a phenomenal job in, in Boston. And, you know, I've got it either between Boston and Carolina. I mean, I, I think Bruce is a tremendous coach. Um The standard with that organization is so high. I mean, every year they go in expecting to win the Stanley Cup. And the, when you got a guy like Patrice Bergeron in your locker room, who everybody adores there, um, you know, he'll, he'll make sure that everybody's pulling the weight. And I don't care what kind of roster they've got. They all play the same way. It's unbelievable. And I'll tell you a quick little story because I know you probably got to go here. But um, when Todd Hall first went to Boston, They're big in finishing every single drill, which is the way you should do it in practice. And Todd Hall took a little bit of a shortcut and then Bruce Cassidy skated up to him and he said, that's not the way we do it here. He said, we finish every single drill. And that, that came from Todd Hall. Um, so that's the standard that they've set there. And that, that goes from one coach to the next coach. It's not just, you know, in Bruce's phenomenal job, but he went in there and that standard was already set. So they expect to win the cup every year and, and they've got the horses, I think, to do it. And they just grind you to death in that building. And when you got a pain in the neck like Marshawn running around, getting under everybody's skin all the time, that's that's the X factor for that club. So I, I, I've got either Boston or Carolina going to the finals. Great stuff. And just to make sure I'm not going anywhere, When you want to tell stories, tell them all night long. <laughs> you be my guest. <laughs> okay. But there's a thing that we need to turn our attention to. Obviously, this uh, conversation is uh, coming out uh, six days from now as we're recording it on Wednesday, September 29th. There's still a week to go then until the start of the National Hockey League season. So a lot can happen in between now and, and then, obviously. But... Um, As October 16th is nearing and as it brings the first live game of our hockey coverage on Pulse 24, it's going to be an interesting one. I have to say when I saw the schedule uh, when it came out, it's going to be the Arizona Coyotes against the Buffalo Sabres. Probably not some of the contending teams, but interesting campaigns that those two's 
that those two teams have ahead of them them, themselves. Um, For all the people who think, okay, Buffalo and Arizona probably doesn't rock my hockey world, give listeners a reason to watch those two teams play on Austrian national TV. Well, for, for Buffalo, you're going to see good young players. Paterka, for one, who played in the Ice Hockey League in, in Salzburg last year. He, I would, I would think he's going to make the starting roster. Now, whether he stays in Buffalo the whole year, I'm not sure. But you know, I would be surprised if he didn't at least start the season there. They've got a lot of good young players. Donnie Granado, their head coach, wants wants their D joining the rush all the time and pressuring the puck in all three zones. So they are going to be an extremely hardworking team and they'll be an exciting team to watch creatively and they'll create offense and they will be buzzing. So that would be the reason to watch Buffalo. The reason to watch Arizona, they've got a new coach in there, Coach Terigny, who is by far probably one of the up and best up and coming coaches in the national hockey league. He, uh, he's a no BS type of guy. He wants his guys competing physically two ways, both, both ends of the ice. Um, so you're going to see one team in Buffalo really pushing the pace in a huge way, maybe not as physical as Arizona and you'll see Arizona pushing the pace but they'll be stopping on every loose puck. They'll be driving the net hard. They'll be finishing every single check. They'll make life miserable for the opponent. So you'll have two different contrasting styles. One in Buffalo, that's very, very high-end pressure. And Arizona will be high-end pressure, but they'll be more physical. So that'll be – that could – and I know it's – not the highlight game that everybody would want to watch. You know, they're not at Stanley Cup contenders – But it could be an incredibly fast-paced game for Austrians to watch. I think it could be a lot of fun. You know that you've got a second career in advertisement if, if you ever intend to do so or to go there. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> One last thing, and, and that's something that a lot of people or people just can't know as, as we don't have insights into the organization, but as opening day is 13 days away from the point of, of this conversation and the recording of it. Do you think the Jack Eichel situation will be resolved by then? Only if they get value back. They're not going to give them away. Um, I know they've been working long and hard on it, and they've been fairly public about it. I thought it was a real courageous move by Kevin Adams to do what he did, took the captaincy away from him, which he should have. I thought that was awesome. Um, and the fact that they're trying to move them, I think is terrific because it comes down to culture and it comes down to 23 guys on the roster, not just one. And Jack Eichel's a great player, no doubt about it. But if he's not going to buy in to what they're doing there, then you got to move on. What's fair value? I think you got to get two roster players minimum, maybe three. And you got to get a first or a second round pick. You, you've got to get you got to get two players and go right into your starting roster. And then you've got to get a couple of prospects, or you got to get a pro legit prospect to put in Rochester that can make it in a year, and a couple of draft picks. I know the price there. I don't know specifically what the price is. I know everybody's saying, "Well, it's too high. It's too high. It's too high." Oh well, yeah, you know, any other GM would be putting it up there too. But high marks to Kevin Adams, high marks to Jason Carmanos and the ownership group there for doing what they're doing. And I do think they'll get it done, but Kevin's been incredibly smart about it, I think. Going to be definitely interesting, going to be a talking point once uh, we hit the NHL season with Pulse24. And coach, obviously there are so many different topics that we could still be talking about, but I heard there are hockey conversations to be held on a golf course. So I need to, <laughs> I need to let you go. So much appreciated that you're taking such extensive time with the Hockey O'Clock podcast. Glad to be talking to you. Looking forward to talking to you again sometime down the road. Sounds good, Martin. And tell, uh, tell Dave Barr, hang in there in Vienna. Good man. Tell him I said hello. Will do. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mehr
davon. 